Hi everyone, Pastor Steve here just wanted to let you know, in order to stay in touch during this time in which uh, we're dealing with the COVID, we have our various internet connections to keep, uh, keep us all connected. The website, gracechurchsac.com, the Facebook page, or you can even email us. At any rate, these are the ways that you can stay connected. Hope you enjoy the devotional or praise and worship, whatever you're about to enjoy, and uh, hope you, please stay safe. today's message. We are in um, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, and we are looking at verses 15 through 20 this Sunday. Before we go into the Word, let us take a moment and pray together. Lord, we thank you for your Word, for your teaching, Jesus, comes right from the Father. Your teaching is life. It is our Father, our Creator at work, transforming our lives, transforming our minds, our very bodies, to live in the freedom that is found in your presence to worship you and to trust you with all of who we are. And so um, may we be glorified, or may we rather glorify your name through what we hear today as it transforms our lives. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus be, um, continues in this chapter with verse 15, speaking to his disciples, and he says, If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. This, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we go into chapter 18, specifically these verses, it is a continuation of what Jesus began at the beginning of the chapter regarding the kingdom. And so going to the beginning of the chapter, it says in the first, uh, first verse, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, So who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And from there on, the topic, if you will, of the kingdom of heaven is taught. Um, regarding its truth, regarding who the greatest is, regarding the reality and the aspects and the very nature of the kingdom itself. So when we get to verse 15, this is a continuation of the discourse that Jesus was teaching to his disciples regarding the kingdom. And with that in mind, he gives an instruction. It's not a rule, if you will. Uh, if you've been involved in any kind of uh, religious institutions, specifically churches, there are various rules and regulations that the community abides by. And if you take a look at the Old Testament, there are not a shortage of various rules and regulations that the Jews were to live by. This is not so much a rule or regulation as it is a characteristic of the kingdom, kingdom living. In other words, in light of the kingdom of which we are now partaking and of which will be fully consummated in the last day at the resurrection, this is how we should learn to live with one another and be in relationship with one another. 
And so he says, if your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. Do not make it a public manner matter where someone may feel publicly disgraced or ashamed or ridiculed. Don't make it public. Because once a matter has gone public, the temptation to shame that person or for that person to feel uh, put upon by, by others or judged by others, ridiculed by others, shamed by others, judged by others, that temptation comes front and center. So don't do that. Don't make it a public spectacle, Jesus is saying. But go to that person in private. And if that person listens to you, you've won them over. Always doing it from a standpoint of prayer. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. That, by the way, is a legal uh, matter or a legal ma manner that is given in the Old Testament, that to resolve disputes, make sure there are two or three witnesses in order that the truth may come out and it's not left to the opinion of one or two people. And so if there's a disagreement and you can't resolve it privately, bring in a small group. Again, don't make it public so that people have an opportunity to gossip or to what well, the, the Greek word is scandalizo, to talk about something, somebody in a manner that scandalizes them or brings them down. Don't do that. Just bring in two or three. And then he says this, if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. Now, when you, when you get to the, that, this uh, verse that talks about church, that Jesus refers to church, very seldom does Jesus use the, the term or the word church very seldom. Paul, the Apostle Paul, uses it quite regularly because he writes many different letters to communities that are called churches. But Jesus very seldom does. He talks more about the kingdom. And when he, in this case, talks about the church, he's expanding this community. And it's important to understand what he means when he uses the term church. Most of us, if we've grown up in church or if we've been exposed to church or even attended church here and there, have an experience of church. And for the most part in our culture, churches tend to be focused on what we call the ABCs, attendance, building, cash. Oh, look at how many people go to this church. Or, contrary, look how few people are here. And that's the, uh, the, the standard, if you will, by which we sometimes make our judgments or opinions about churches. The other is buildings. Look at the facilities that they have. They have a, a building for the youth and a building for fellowship and a building, or maybe it's a smaller quaint building, either or. The buildings certainly take on recognition with regards to churches or the cash. Look at what they can do. Look at the programs that they can afford, etc. Those are man-made, contrived ways of looking at institutions that are called churches. That is not what Jesus is referring to here at all. What Jesus is referring to is the Greek word that we translate church, which is ekklesia. It means primarily and almost exclusively, actually, community. It's the community specifically of those people who have, in hearing the gospel message, or in this case, hearing the gospel message and experiencing Jesus' ministry firsthand, have decided through the Spirit and have recognized through the Spirit that Jesus is the Messiah. And as such, they will build their lives, their entire lives, their hopes, their expectations, the truth of their lives built on his teaching and who he is. They are people, in other words, who are called out of the world, out of the world in terms of how the world thinks, how the world prioritizes, how the world acts and behaves towards one another, and instead, not being part of the world, although they're in it, to belong exclusively to the Son of God, to Jesus himself. And as such, it is a brand new community. It is a community that never has existed on the planet 
before Jesus. It is a community that are, it is coming together by the Spirit and learning together how to live in this unseen reality called the kingdom, but doing so in this world with other people who also are called out of the world to belong to Jesus. It is relational at its core, not programmatic, not um, in, in, in a manner that we come together for events, although events can be helpful. The community is to live manifesting the reality of the kingdom within relationships. So the, the relationships between the people of this community differ vastly from any other relationships that are found in the world because it is established on the love of God as the love of God is expressed in Jesus himself. This is why Jesus can say, bring it to the church. Because as a church, as a community, being led by the Spirit, the church can be a safe place for, or should be a safe place for people to work through their differences, to work through their shortcomings, to work through the issues that may have separated them or may cause division because Jesus in the, is in the midst of them. This is what he says at the very end of this uh, reading. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. And Jesus himself will lead us through all of the various issues that fall bef before us in, in our community and come up before us in our community. And because he is there, it is a model for the rest of the world how to reconcile one another, how to, how to cover one another's failings with love, how to look at one another and not focus on their failings or shortcomings or sin, but on who they are in Christ and to work towards a mature completion and, and whole realization of that identity. And this is why Jesus puts such emphasis in this teaching on the church. Of course, if he says that person doesn't pay attention even to this community, then treat him like a Gentile. In other words, treat him like anybody who functions according to the manner of the world. Do not, do not consider them part of the community if they are unwilling to live within the reality of Christ among us. Then he goes on to say, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. In other words, whatever you give the most attention to and are attached to will follow you wherever you go, and you will be defined by them. Your character will be defined by them, whatever that may be. And in this case, what's very interesting is he starts this teaching with a person who has an issue with another person. And if they hold on to that issue and do not turn that over to God for God to work through it, but are holding on to that, it will define them. And it will actually carry with them, be carried with them into the heavenly realms. In other words, as we are going and living out our lives, whatever we attach ourselves to, whether they're earthly things, possessions, or whether they're simply circumstances that have come our way that have formed us, whatever we hold on to that comes between us fully realizing who we are in Christ and learning to take on his character and being involved in the transformation of our lives to be like him, that will also be carried with us into the heavenly realms. And so this is a powerful teaching, first of all, in bringing out the importance of this community. And when you take a look at our churches, it's challenging to be a community in this day and age. At best... When we come into church, we may, if we're, 
if we go attend a large church, we probably don't know hardly anybody there. We can sit among thousands of people and maybe be inspired or participate in beautiful worship, hear the word of God. But without that community relational aspect, we miss the realization of God's promises as God intended to have those realized within community. We are to be a light to the world because of the community in which we belong, not individualistically alone. And so it's important for, it's such an important reality that Jesus uses the term church. And I think it's important to realize the, the word itself and what it means and that it's relational. It's not programmatic. It's not institutional. It's not financial, although all of those things may play a part or a role, but it is relational. And how we treat one another, how we treat ourselves, how we are in relationship with one another is a direct result of our relationship with God. Because as Jesus says in the end of the reading today, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there. And so, my friends in Christ, we belong to Christ, and he belongs to us. And as such, as challenging as that may be, we truly do belong to one another in Christ as we learn to live more and more fully in the reality of his kingdom. May we, together with all the saints, learn how to manifest his glory as we learn how to love one another the way Christ loves us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. And may we learn how to live in love towards one another the way you love us. And this we pray in the name of your son, who's demonstrated your love to the fullest extent. Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Well, I hope that today's message was it's not only inspirational, but edifying to you as we continue to grow together in our uh, discipleship. And I hope to uh, see you again next time we have our devotionals. Uh, we are continuing to meet on Sundays at 9 o'clock uh, here in the patio. And we are also having Facebook Live Praise and Worship at 10 o'clock, both Sunday morning and Wednesday. Until then, you have a great day in the Lord, and I'll see you next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.